Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome to church this morning. Welcome to our church family. Um, welcome to those uh, who uh, have joined us from around the country. Uh, welcome to those who are going to be watching this at a different time of week. Um, let's all give one another a little Zoom wave. Um, just a couple of pieces of family news to share with you. Um, Pat is slowly in Improving, and the family would like to say how grateful they are for all our prayers. So that's good news. Um, and actually, we're very delighted to have Joe with us this morning. Uh, just for those that don't know, um, Joe uh, has just recently tested positive from COVID, haven't you, Joe? And you're confined to your room. If you, Joe, if you want to unmute, you can tell everybody how you are. I'm done. Yes, you're done. How are you, Joe? I'm fine. I'm fine. Good. Just a sore throat, I understand. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's lovely to have you join with us from your bedroom, which is where you're confined to at the moment, all of you, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And we hope that you soon start to feel better soon. Yeah. Lovely, Joe. Okay, everybody. Um, so we gather now together in God's, pre God's presence. So you can see behind me um, in my study some of my books. I might not have as many theological books on my shelves as I know some ministers do, but I still nonetheless have quite a few. And each book in its own way seeks to explore who God is, what God is like, and therefore how we should behave. For these are the twin aspects of faith, believing and behaving. Or in other words, we might want to say today, seeing God and understanding God. And these two aspects are what our two readings today are going to touch on. But of all the densely written books on my shelves, perhaps the book that delights me the most is a children's book I bought a few years ago called Images of God. Its pages contain simple drawings and explanations of what God is like, but their simplicity is misleading, I think, for in their own way, each is profound and draws us closer into the mystery of God. And as we think this morning about seeing God and understanding God. We're going to be using some of these images and words to help bring us into a deeper understanding of God. And so now for our call to worship, we're going to use one of these images. God is a mystery. God is present everywhere, and yet some say he is not there. He re reigns over the world with his love, and yet the world is full of misery. He wants us to know him, and yet he doesn't show himself. He is completely unlike us, and yet makes us in his image. But because God is a mystery, we have to work harder to understand him better. Let's pause for a moment as we prepare ourselves for this piece of work this morning. And so as we continue this work of understanding God better, God better, we're going to sing our first hymn, Be Still and Know 
that I am God. So we are thinking today about seeing God and understanding God, issues at the very heart of our believing and our behaving. We're going to use more of the pictures and words from the book Images of God to enable us to draw close to God now in prayer. And so first an image depicting God as majesty and a prayer of praise. God is majesty. God is everywhere. And he holds all things, the earth, the heavens, and the creatures that live in them. His glory is even grander than the heavens. When we try to imagine such greatness, it can be a little scary, but we can also just be amazed. The next image is entitled God is Mercy. So I invite you now to think of those things of which you are not proud. Confess them to God. And hear now these words. God is mercy. God comforts us when we are not proud of what we've done. God always looks at us with eyes full of mercy because he loves in us what we wish to be. 
and under that look of mercy, we become better. May that be so. Amen. In our Old Testament reading, we have a conversation between God and Moses, in which Moses is pleading with God to show the Israelites what God is really like. Haven't we all at one time or another wanted to know such a thing, to really see God? Chris and Ian are going to read this conversation for us using the contemporary English version of the Bible. A reading from Exodus 33, 12 to 23. In this reading, I am the Lord. And I am Moses. Lord, I know that you've told me to lead these people to the land you promised them, but you have not told me who my assistant will be. You have said you are my friend and that you are pleased with me, if this is true, let me know what your plans are. Then I can obey and continue to please you. And don't forget that you have chosen this nation to be your own. I will go with you and give you peace. If you aren't going with us, please don't make us leave this place. But if you do go with us, everyone will know that you are pleased with your people and with me. That way we will be different from the rest of the people on earth. I will do what you have asked because I am your friend and I am pleased with you. I pray that you will let me see you in all your glory. All right. I am the Lord and I show mercy and kindness to anyone I choose. I will let you see my glory and hear my holy name, but I won't let you see my face because anyone who sees my face will die. There is a rock not far from me. Stand beside it and before I pass by in all of my shining glory, I will put you in a large crack in the rock. I will cover your eyes with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will take my hand away and you will see my back. You will not see my face. Amen. Let us hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Thank you, Chris and Ian. Every week as a little girl, I attended church and Sunday school in Petswood Methodist Church. Here, the wall at the front of the church that stretches up to the pinnacle of the ceiling is plain, unpainted, unvarnished red brick, typical of the style of 1970s churches. Presumably to soften the look, a blue velvet curtain has always hung over that wall as a backdrop to the communion table. As children, my sister and I used to imagine that behind that curtain was God. I wondered why God never came out from behind that curtain, for I would jolly well have liked to have seen him. Can God be known? And if so, how? This is the timeless yearning of humanity. And it's not so much a question about knowledge as a quest of faith which seeks understanding. Which of us has not cried out at one time or another, God, I need you. You. I need you to speak. I need you to be present and not in some hidden way. I need to know you are there and I need to know it now. 
There's a story told of a young woman who had a very difficult decision to make, one that she felt was hugely important, one that would change the course of her life forever. At first, she prayed calmly and gently, hoping that clarity from God would come. It did not. As time went on, the young woman grew from concerned to stressed to panicked, to angry. God, you say you love me. You say you care about my life. You say you are here for me. Where are you? Speak, show up. The young woman resolved not to move from her room until she had heard from God a very clear answer. It was not long to her surprise before she received her answer. God showed up with remarkable clarity. But God did not tell her what to do in regard to the decision that she had to make. However, God became intimately present to her. God graced her angst-filled silence with calm and peace and told her again and again, I love you. It seemed that God perceived a more urgent question. God addressed a more important matter. And suddenly that young woman's question, which previously had been so pressing, could wait. At the beginning of our reading today, Moses asks for answers to his problems. But by the end, he simply asks to see God's glory, or in other words, God's presence. This is the ultimate and most precious gift we can be given. We often mistakenly believe that God is the giver of all the good things we could possibly desire. But in a very real sense, God has nothing to give at all except himself. And this is the most precious gift for us to treasure. In the midst of our questions and our concerns, God is already nearer and always greater than we can know. Even if God doesn't answer our questions. Let us ponder for a moment or two on this precious gift in your life. God's presence. This image is entitled, God is with us. This God of words and of silence. This God of light and of night. This God who is strength, beauty, peace, love and forgiveness. This God who heals, who frees and who saves. God is the one we call our Father. He is with us every day until the day we will be with him. If the Exodus reading is all about seeing God's presence in our lives, then our gospel reading is what we should do with it. Or in other words, 
how we should behave. In our reading, the Pharisees try to set a trap for Jesus. And Maggie is going to read it for us. I am reading from the New International Version of the Bible. It's Matthew chapter 22, verses 15 to 22. Paying taxes to Caesar. Then the Pharisees went out and laid plans to trap him in his words. They sent their disciples to him along with the Herodians. Teacher, they said, we know you are a man of integrity and that you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. You aren't swayed by men because you pay no attention to who they are. Tell us then, in your opinion, is it right to pay taxes to Caesar or not? But Jesus knowing their evil intent, said, You hypocrites, why are you trying to trap me? Show me the coin used for paying the tax. They bought him a denarius, and he asked them, Whose portrait is this, and whose inscription? Caesar's, they replied. Then he said to them, Give to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God, what is God's. When they heard this, they were amazed. So they left him and went away. We thank the Lord for his good words. Thank you, Maggie. <clears throat> the theological question before us here is this. What is the right relationship between obedience to the state and obedience to God? For centuries, Christians have faced this dilemma. Sometimes in the person of Dietrich Bonhoeffer, for example, who was imprisoned in a concentration camp in Nazi Germany because of his opposition, Christians have got it right but very often we have failed. You only have to look at the church in apartheid South Africa or in the days of slavery to see how the Bible was used to justify such unchristlike behavior and politics. We are quite possibly facing such a dilemma right now. And I am being intentionally provocative this morning as a way of challenging us all to think about these things carefully. In the interest of keeping the COVID infection levels low in our community, the government is requiring us to forfeit a wide range of activities. Some of this means that people's livelihoods will suffer terribly and millions more will find themselves on the brink of poverty. Some of this means that we are not allowed to visit people who are suffering from terrible isolation and the subsequent impact on their mental and emotional health. These two issues weigh heavily now, either upon us or upon our nation. What is the right thing for us to do? To obey the COVID rules imposed on us by the government for the safety of the whole of the community or to break them in order, for example, to offer what is possibly much needed pastoral care. Given the narrative that we are being told, are we being as wise as we should be? Or is it only after the fact, when it's all over, that we are able to tell whether we judged the narrative 
correctly or were taken in by it? What is the right relationship here between obedience to the state and obedience to God? Politicians who have to make these new COVID rules and we who are living through this pandemic have a fine line to tread. Should we be collaborators or subversives? Perhaps it will only be with the benefit of hindsight that we will know the answer to this question. But there is comfort perhaps in Jesus's refusal to make the conundrum of rendering to Caesar or rendering to God an easy question. The answers are simple, only for those who regard Caesar either as God or as the devil, who see everything in simplistic black and white terms. Meanwhile, the rest of us live in a more complicated world of shades of grey. And therefore, we must be honest with ourselves and others as we wrestle with the right path to take. May God bless us with seeing him and understanding his ways. So we spend some moments in silence as we ponder the dilemmas, the questions, the choices big and small that we face and pray that God will bless us with seeing and understanding. Look at this image. God is a path. When everything looks too difficult, when we don't know where to go anymore, when it seems we stand before a closed gate or on the bank of a river that is impossible to cross, we need to call on God to help us go forward. When we understand that his love awaits us. We won't be mistaken about the path. We're going to pray now. Let us pray. Help us to remember that when we can't find the words, you listen, O oh God, to our hearts, and your spirit pleads for us in sighs too deep to be spoken. Lover of justice, we hold before you the peoples of the world establish equity and grant wisdom. Strong God, we hold before you the church throughout the world and our own church. Strengthen our hearts and renew our vision. Merciful one, we hold before you now those we know who are in need. Reach out, we pray, with healing and restoration, encircle in comfort and care. 
listening God. Refresh our sense of your presence and strengthen and guide us day by day until with all your beloved people, we see you face to face in your kingdom. In Jesus name we pray, Amen. And we each say together in our own homes, those words that Jesus taught us saying, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Our final hymn uses the words that apparently John Wesley said on his deathbed, best of all, is God is with us. This, I think, is what I want us to take away from our time together this morning. Best of all is God is with us. God will hold and never fail. Keep that truth when storms are raging. God remains, though faith is frail. Best of all is God is with us. Life goes on and needs are met. God is strongest our weakness, love renews, will not forget. Best of all is God is with us, hearts are challenged, strangely warmed. Faith is deepened, courage strengthened, grace received and hope reformed. Best of all is God is with us in our joy and through our pain. Till that final acclamation, life is Christ and death is pain. Best of all is God is with us as we scale eternal heights. Love grows stronger, undiminished, earth grows dim by heaven's flight. So in a moment we will be going to our coffee groups as normal. If you are leaving us and not joining the groups, then we thank you for being with us this morning. And now our blessing. May we see you, O oh God, and in seeing, be drawn into greater understanding, and in understanding, be moved into right living, and may God be our company. Christ Jesus, walk before us, and the Spirit surround us with a cloud of grace. Amen. Amen.